Welcome to the Coco Vid Vid Show. My name is Cody, and I will be your host today. As no surprise to anybody who knows who I am, we're going to start today in the software development industry. I'm here with Kyle Schmitz. He has over 12 years experience working in software development, and that includes working at ComIT as a teacher, uh, working as a scrum master at Ubisoft, and he currently works at D2L as a software development manager. Kyle, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, not a problem. Glad to help out. So uh, I think we could get started with first going over what it is D2L does, if you don't mind, and what your role as a software development manager at the company entails. For sure. Yeah, software... Um... <laughs> Already off to a great start. Something on my words. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. So D2L actually specializes in education software, which, uh, as we can tell, is extremely important in today's day and age with what with the pandemic going on. Um, they have their main um, suite, which is called Brightspace. Mm -hmm. And so as a, let's say, a school board or a university or some sort of education institution, you would um, buy into Brightspace and there's various tools um, that can be uh, purchased either as add-ons or as come come with the Brightspace platform uh, that enable you to do different types of learning. Um, the one that I actually work on with my team is called Portfolio. Um, it's a really interesting uh, piece of software that allows students to take what is called evidence of learning. There's some research into the thought that um, by having students select um, pieces of things that they've worked on, um, that show that they've learned certain objectives, it helps reinforce those concepts. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting uh, application that my team works on, along with another tool called Brightspace for Parents, um, hmm. which is a parent portal to allow them to see what their, um, their kids uh, have been doing in school and how well they've been doing feedback they've received from teachers, that sort of thing. Um, so my role as a software development manager um, I have uh, a couple different people that I work with, um, a product manager as well as a designer. And the three of us um, work to make the product as successful as possible. And we're really enabled by a, a team of developers as well as test developers. Um, so my job is to kind of vouch for the technical side of the application. You know, we have the product manager who's responsible for making sure that we're meeting client needs and that mm -hmm. we're advancing our roadmap and we're able to um, get people onto our tool. We have our designer to make sure that it's, um, we have a really solid UI and UX that's very usable um, and uh, easy to use. And then for my side, I have to make sure that we're meeting our technical needs for uptime DevOps, um, that we're actually able to break it down into technical tasks that developers can finish um, and that we're delivering on certain milestones and by certain dates. Definitely seems like it's uh, probably very important these days in this these circumstances having the software available to teachers. Can you, can you speak a little bit more about who, what kind of schools are using your software at, at all, or uh, what or is it a K to twelve thing? Or do you also target universities? What uh, what kind of ranges of students are using it and teachers as well? There's actually three main categories of clients that we have. The first one would be K to twelve. Um, the second one would be university. And then the third one is actually corporate. Um, so a lot of different corporate uh, businesses will need some sort of education platform that they could have courses on that their employees can take. Um, for our tool specifically that we're working on, um, we're mainly seeing success in the K to 12 space. Um, and then what we actually are going through right now is a period where we have to adjust our feature set in order to meet the needs more of higher education because you know when you look at a learner that's less let's say especially in the younger side of things sure. in the you know k to six kind of range their needs are extremely different than higher ed needs so through d2l's suite in brightspace you know what tools are important and how those tools are used varies widely depending on the intended audience if it's higher education or k-12 for sure and and uh speaking of changing needs and circumstances and, and different teaching styles. How has the current climate of schools and the situation of uh, we're in, in places like in Winnipeg right now, where schools have to be a lot more strict and perhaps doing a lot more remote learning, teachers are having to learn uh, new ways of reaching their students. How has that new climate impacted uh, the software? So, some software such as Brightspace or por Portfolio that D2L provides? Uh, it's, it's impacted us in a lot of ways. Um, it's it's uh, 
when, well, for context, when I started at D2L back in March, that was, you know, the the pandemic was 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 in the early growing phase at that point where, you know, people started to lock things down. And especially in Winnipeg, you know, we hadn't received any sort of like, you know, lockdown mandate or anything like that. Um, I actually had three full days in the office before they said, okay, we're shutting everything down now. Everyone has to, to work from home just for some context. So um, at the same time, schools were going through the same thing. You know, they were mm -hmm. starting to close down schools. And so what that did was it basically took our usage and it just shot through the roof. Sure. Um, we had, you know, quite a few clients that were already using our software, but all of a sudden there was such increased demand, increased need, increased load on our, our servers. And it also even turned some use cases that we had that were quite well established and kind of turned them on their head. Hmm. Um, for instance, for a portfolio, our most common use case in the K-12 space was actually in-class usage. So the idea is that the instructor, the teacher, has their own iPad and they're handing it to students and the students are using it. Well, all of a sudden what we had was everyone was learning from home. Sure. So the teacher is totally out of the equation. They need to now use our software to submit work from at home so the teacher can view it in their own home. So now instead of having a teacher that is very familiar with the software is walking you through it, mm -hmm. you have a parent. And right. the parent isn't necessarily familiar with our software. And so one of the first things that we had to do as soon as I started was we had to release new functionality to make it easier for parents to help their kids do the same thing that they were already doing in class. Um, and that's just one minor example where we had to pivot extremely fast to meet this kind of new use case, which is right. learning from home, essentially. Um, and we are continuing to see that where we do have a lot of schools that have, you know, they've opened up again, kids are learning in class, but a lot of um, different institutions are preparing or are already prepared for the fact that they might have to switch back to remote learning, which means we have more people onboarding with our software. We have more functionality that we're trying to get the door to make that transition smoother. Um, you know, whether it's increased, um, you know, support staff, increased uh, throughput for features, um, even just like um, increased ability to handle the load on our servers, because we're right. seeing just incredible spikes in usage um, from our data centers. So it's, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, that was, I was going to ask you about that a little bit, but I, you've sort of covered it a bit. Just like, what what is kind of the distribution? And coming from a obviously a software development background myself, I am kind of curious. What has the background, uh, the focus, and the distribution been on work for either expanding functionality, uh, creating new use cases, um, or making it's more usable using like parents are having to use it now versus teachers. Teachers have more time to get familiar with it. Uh, parents, maybe you need the software to be just a lot more intuitive and how much of it are you also spending on technical infrastructure? Uh, I, I would assume from the increased usage, how much problems have you had maybe with bottlenecks and in, in technology there? And, and could you speak a little bit about that and kind of a breakdown of all those new problems kind of having to be addressed? For sure. Well, as any software development, you know, company or project, there's always a balance between whether you're doing tech debt DevOps or your feature roadmap. Um, I will say that D2L has put a, a ton of emphasis on making sure that we're able to hit the increased load that we were expecting in semester start. So we have a um, our, our common dates that we are mainly focused on is semester starts. So that would be January um, and then September as well, when you know students are coming back in from breaks for summer vacation. It, has um, it has it been like a noticeably larger like spike than previous years? Noticeable I know you haven't been is there. an understatement. <laughs> um, I won't I won't be able to give uh, specifics, but we've seen um, an order of magnitude wow. higher usage, and so we had a, a very strong push to make sure that we were able to handle that increased load. Um, we've also had some, like I said, features that we've been doing for usability, uh, but D2L was actually already in a pretty good position for uh, maintaining our current roadmap. And so even for my team right now, you know, we we did have to pivot and implement some couple of features in short order to help with um, being able to learn from home. But at the same time, um, I wouldn't say, you know, it's back to 100% business as usual, but we're definitely able to um, execute on our existing roadmap and, and go back to those existing plans because we do have clients um, that have been waiting on certain features and things like that. So, sure. um, yeah, it's it's been a mix. So a little bit of a non-answer, but no, I, I, kind of what I expected. That's <laughs> yeah. that's usually the case when in, in anywhere I've worked for for myself. Let's switch a little bit into just kind of working in the work environment in general uh, at your office as it has compared to 
previous workplaces you've been part of, uh, what's it been like to, I, I, are you, is everybody in the company fully remote right now? Um, is there anybody even in the office? What is the current situation at your workplace in terms of how you are working as a, as an organization? So D2L maintains several different offices. Um, for our Winnipeg office right now, everyone is working fully remote um, and they've been pretty much fully remote the entirety of my employment there. Um, we do have uh, one, maybe two offices where there has been um, kind of a, a very structured return to work um, policy that they've worked on where things have been voluntary. Um, they've you know, made sure to implement new you know, procedures and guidelines to maintain social distancing, maintain you know, the, um, I would say like the, the cleaning of the office, that sort of thing. So people are coming in on a very like periodic basis. Um, but for the most part, it's been, it's been almost 100% remote. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really making sure that everyone's equipped to be remote for the long term. We're really not uh, assuming that there's going to be, you know, um, any sort of change to how things have been going for quite a while. Um, so everyone's kind of like, you know, hunkering down for the long haul at this point. Sure. And how much experience in the past have you had with remote working and barely any at all. So like a lot of the companies <laughs> I work for, and this is so funny to me, um, have been like, we can't work from home. How could we possibly work from home? You need to be in the office. This is way too valuable. Uh -huh. You can't work from home. So like I've had the odd day here and there where it's like, oh, I've got, you know, a guy delivering something and I got to be at home right now. So I would have like maybe one day out of months working from home. Yeah. But other than that, like all my jobs have always been in the office, you know, the whole nine to five kind of thing. So this is my first experience being, it's like thrown into the deep end, like just sure. like fully remote um, all the time. And, and how has that uh, adjustment been in terms of be, be, being able to switch into work mode or, uh, uh yeah, how's that adjustment been? Like, I think there's in, in this industry, there are people who have uh, worked a lot fully remotely for big parts of their career. They've, uh, software development is one industry that can be well, uh, suited for that. And we've had people who work purely as contractors and work out of their home offices. Um, but then there's people like you and me, uh, who have worked our entire careers based going into offices and occasionally working from home. And it just feels like it needs to be what from meeting different software developers or meeting different people fraught within the industry. It's almost a different personality of a person that can work from home, uh, as a contractor versus somebody that goes in the office. So has it been an adjustment for you and how has it been for your team? And, um, I, it's, it sounds like you've been remote most of the time you've been at that company, but I wonder if you get a, a sense into how the other personalities on your team have been adjusting to the new work, uh, reality. Yeah. And it's, it really depends on who you ask. It's funny that you say it takes a certain kind of person to like fully work, uh, remote D2L had a pretty, um, flexible policy before I started, you know, even though we had an office, um, people were able to work, you know, remotely here and there, um, kind of as they, as they needed to. And so it depends on who you talk to. Like for some people I talk to on the team, they're just like, I love this. I have so much more time in the day. I don't have a commute. Mm. Um, I have everything I need here. Why would I need to be in the office? Um, I'll admit that I, I'm not used to this and it's been an adjustment period for sure. I actually really like being in the office. Um, I just find that I like having that separation between work and home where, you know, even though I had a commute, like that was to me a, a benefit because it's like, I, I, leave in the morning, I catch the bus, it's a half hour ride. I have time to kind of like transition my mindset into work mode. I that's, get into work. That's how I listen to all of my audiobooks. Yeah, I, that's I how I catch up on news. To, yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't listen to books anymore. Yeah. So like, then I would, you're at work and this is now work mode. Um, but at the same time you have, you know, kind of social interactions along the way you see someone in the kitchen, um, when you're getting coffee, you, you know, stop by someone's desk, you chat a little bit, you mm -hmm. get to know your coworkers that way. So there's that social connection, but it's also like, this is the place where I get work done at the end of the day, catch the bus ride home, you know, catch up on some YouTube channels, things like that. Um, kind of get out of work mode and get home. And now I'm in home mode and I typically would be in the habit of leaving my laptop at work. So I can't even work from home if I wanted to, because it allows me to fully decompress and be now I'm in home mode. You know, I'm not even going to think about work. There's no point. My laptop's not even here. Um, 
and I find that uh, it's been really uh, a challenge working from home to have that kind of mental separation. You know, mm-hmm. even though I have a separate office in the basement, even though you know I have a start time and an end time where I clock out and I say, yeah, you know, at four thirty. Um, I'm done. I'm in family mode. It's still kind of like is in your mind a little bit where you're like, oh, I could, uh, I got some stuff that, you know, I really should get done. Maybe I'll, I'll log an extra hour or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I prefer being in the office where I can. I, I fully understand that we, like, I fully understand and support that we need to be remote at this point. But I'll admit that if uh, this pandemic was over tomorrow and you're like, do you want to go back to the office? I'd actually be one of the first people to be like, yep, yeah, I'd like to go back. I'd like to get that that separation of like physical space. Mm-hmm. Um, I just find that that's uh, an environment that I work better under. Yeah, and there's so many, I, I, I think a lot about that, uh, uh, about work environments in an office and just like you mentioned, just going in for the act of walking into an office, saying hi to people, you have all these quick, uh, I, I like to call them just like these collisions, right? Like these, uh, um, uh, yeah, these, these, these unplanned collisions and conversations. And sometimes, sometimes I feel like a lot of actual work and productivity can happen in those conversations. You talk to somebody from a different team that you weren't planning on talking to that day, and you just happen to have a conversation about something, and then that triggers something. You have a meeting later in the day, and that can be an entire new line of uh, of productivity that you didn't even have considered before and i feel like that is something that is a big thing that we are probably losing without this in-person uh context this in-person conversations and just the, the, the physical act of walking into an office where there are other people and just that socialization aspect uh, is that something that you've you've noticed too? Like oh, for sure. And I mean, like especially in the kind of role that I have as a software development manager, mm-hmm. you know, relationships are key. And I I always want to be part of the team to to feel like I I have a personal connection with everyone there. You know, you never want to be in a position where you feel you know like someone's boss, or you feel like this is my my role here is to check in when, you know, things aren't going well or to, you know, uh, you know, kind of, kind of lead from a different place than being like part of the group. And Mm. part of that I find is having those kinds of connections where, you know, you're, you're in with the mix, like, like both in the work and and physically, to be honest, like you're, you're sitting with everyone else on the team. You're having those kinds of conversations. You have that banter that happens, you know, you talk about how their day was, um, it allows you to feel so much more embedded. And I find that you don't really get that these days. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from, you know, sending someone a message on Slack or or having a Zoom call, but there's some sort of like, there's an air of like, it's an event now. There's an expectation that if you're starting a Zoom call with me, there's a purpose. (laughs) It's a very deliberate action. You know, I have to message you and be like, hey, can you jump on a Zoom call? We both fire up Zoom. We stare into the webcam. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about our thing. And then there's like a clear end. It doesn't have I had to create the entire concept of this show so I could talk to people again. That's (laughs) Otherwise, there's just... (laughs) Can I call you? Why? (laughs) Like, uh, I'm doing uh, an interview for a TV uh, for a show. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so I find that uh, you don't get that same level of connection, that same level of just being, you know, part of the team and part of the group, because you yeah. don't have those, like you said, those those collisions, those little conversations that happen that are really what I find build that connection very slowly over time. You know, I can, and I've done this before, like, you know, book, this sounds so ridiculous as I say it, but like book a meeting to have a conversation just to get to know someone. I've done sure. those, but like, even I've done those just, in person. Like I've done those in person. Oh yeah, for sure. And it's it's a great way to just let, let's just chat. You know, yeah. it's not about work or anything specific. It's just to get to know each other. But like, you know, it's not it's not the same as that very slow incremental getting to know someone just through like repeated small little conversations and exposures. Um, yeah, it's I find it, uh, it it's a different feeling almost. It it doesn't feel the same as when I have the same kind of connections in the office um it's, it's harder been... to know if like that guy is the guy who just swears at himself at the keyboard like you you would hear that in an office <laughs> <laughs> i don't even know if they're real they could all be fake we could have just gotten really good at having like stock footage and it's one guy know, and an amazing deep fake algorithm <laughs> just collecting like five paychecks <laughs> 
Oh man, that sounds like a future scam. <laughs> you know, if someone's completing five people's amount of work, um, you know, yeah, I guess there's five paychecks. Yeah, it's... <laughs> he probably deserves it. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's figured out a way around the system. That's totally fine by me. Can I hire more of that person, please? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll take five more of that person. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you talked about like having to book time to to just have these conversations with people and talk about like doing it normally in, in a normal work environment anyway but i, I wonder if, there, if you have any strategies with how, like how how do you try to keep um a lot of the companies i've worked for culture has been very important uh at least in my mind i'm also very conscious of culture with the teams i i've, I've led and i've managed how, have you had to try any new strategies with uh, this this environment with through Slack. Have you done? I know some heard some companies do like uh, hanging out and listening to music together, that kind of thing. Has have you tried anything like that, or has have you had any luck with any <laughs> new new socializing experiences or new culture building experiences? In, in yeah, those are two different questions. The first one: Have we tried anything? We've tried a couple of things. Um, one of them is we have a a reoccurring meeting every day at eleven o'clock. We call it coffee break. And the idea is it's a meeting where the only rule is you can't talk about work, mm. you know, so you just, you join it, um, chat about whatever, you know, um, you'll get a random group of people. It's, there's about like 20 people on the list or so right now. Um, and it's just to, to chit chat and get to know each other. Um, we also have another one that happens on Fridays where we, you know, at the end of the day, we kind of clock out and play some games, things like Jackbox and stuff like that. But in terms of like, you know, has it been successful? Um, it's hit and miss, you know, it started off really strong, but I find that it's usually the first thing to go on people's calendars. You know, if they have some work that needs to get done or, you know, looking for a time slot to book a meeting, to have an important conversation, well, you know, I'm here to work. I don't need to be at this, you know, 11 o'clock coffee break meeting. So I'll just, I'll work through that or I'll book a meeting through that. Mm -hmm. And I, I totally mm -hmm. get it. Um, but it's when it's scheduled like that, I find that it's usually the first thing to go, um, which is really unfortunate. So, you know, we've we've tried to mix it up a couple times. Um, another one that we did, which was actually really great, was we did a an offsite. You know, where typically in normal times you'd you know book a, a conference kind of area, usually through like a hotel or something like that, and you do like a whole day thing and go for lunch and etc. Right. You know, we we did the same kind of thing where it's like, okay, today we're not going to do normal work. We're going to do different breakout sessions and group building, like team building exercises. Um, and then we also like everyone ordered skip and we all had lunch anyways, <laughs> even though it was all skipped separately. And you that, that was you really You purposely great. messed up orders. So some guy got your order and you just... Yeah. <laughs> Someone ate like the last one that didn't have the thing that you couldn't eat or something like that. If you've got like some sort of intolerance or I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, it was pretty good. So we've, we've tried to mix it up a few times. Um, but once again, you know, it's, uh, it's not the same, you know, I hate yeah. to beat that drum, but it's just like, you know, you're not going to like stop going for coffee, you know, and bumping into people that way, but you could stop going to a coffee break meeting that's in your calendar. Yeah. Um, and I find that in other companies too, if they have social things going on, you know, a lot of companies I worked for, if it's like Friday, it's end of the sprint, um, four o'clock, people will, you know, check out and start playing games or hanging out in the lounge. You hear that, you know, you hear people's voices, you hear them yeah. going to the fridge and grabbing a drink. Um, you have people, you know, literally stopping by your desk and be like, hey, come hang out with us. Like, you're good for the day, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Here, it's like, you if you can hear music playing or something down the hall. Exactly. It's a different environment. You know, it's, it's very easy to... Um, hide when you're working remotely you know like hide into your work essentially where you're just like oh, i've got stuff to do you know i'm not going to join that zoom call and you just keep typing away and how is anyone gonna poke you and be like they could send you a message on slack but mm -hmm. it's not the same as like someone showing up at your desk and be like hey come hang out with us grab a drink you know it's it's friday let's 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 chat for a while and decompress that sort of thing yeah yeah it's and, and i imagine some personalities um are more comfortable with being able to to hide and, and probably thrive on that and um you know it, it could be good in terms of making those people feel more comfortable and 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 maybe even more productive mm -hmm. uh, but it, it just it does feel like it is detrimental and to the team culture to, to to some extent right like it's it's missing you're missing something still and even even if as an individual maybe some certain people can 
fall into it's 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 true for all of us though right like the something about the world as it is now as uh, the circumstances as it is now allows us to be the worst of ourselves uh <laughs> and the best of ourselves sometimes but we can it's, we can sink we can fall back into bad habits we can fall back into the shadows we can uh hide if we want to hide uh and that's both you know com comfortable for people but also potentially damaging uh, to culture as For a company sure. and as a team. Um, but on that note, has, has there anything been anything about this new work normal that you feel like has actually been a positive? Have you, have you compared to previous places you have worked before? Have you been like, oh, this is interesting since we're all working so digitally anyway, or we're so working through Slack all the time anyway, we've actually been able to, um, I don't know, like, is, has there any, been anything that seems like, oh, this might actually be a, a lesson learned, a, uh, a process that you've learned that might stick around? Is there anything like that that you can think yeah, of? Yeah, I mean, one of the, the less obvious ones that even from myself and some other people that I've talked to is if people are able to invest some of the gained time that they have back into like their home mm. life and their family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for myself, um, I have, uh, you know, almost a two year old now and I would miss, you know, breakfasts in the morning as well as dinner in the evening. You know, when you have a, a two year old, they run on their own schedule sometimes. And so I would have to leave the house in the morning at like eight o'clock. Um, and then I would get home probably around 6.30. And so if she had breakfast at like 8 o'clock, 8.15, you know, because she didn't wake up until then, and then she needs to eat dinner at like 4.30, mm -hmm. I don't get that, you know, so I miss all of that on the front end and the tail end. You know, there'd be days where I'd come home and I would be like, you know, texting my wife and be like, you know, please keep her up just like five more minutes. I'm almost home. So I would get to see her because she'd yeah. be yawning and kind of cranky because she's tired and she has to get put to bed. Where now I actually, I... I get to see her in the morning and in the afternoon. Like I, I actually do breakfast, lunch, and dinner with her, you know, cause yeah. I'm working in the house. I could come upstairs and have lunch with you guys. Um, and I've heard a lot of other people share the same kind of mindset that they're able to either like, if it's like projects at home, things like that. Um, so that's, that's yeah. been really nice. Actually, that's a, definitely a benefit. Definitely like com commuting is not a factor <laughs> anymore. Yeah. My commute is like going down the stairs and that's it. Um, in terms of, of work, it's, it's tough. I don't want to say that there's no benefit. Um, maybe because like as part of my role, you know, I, I hear about the things that aren't necessarily working well and sure. Just the nature of, of where you are positioned. Yeah. And, and one of the ones that comes to mind is that, you know, uh, it's almost like meeting overload, um, mm. where everything we talked about this already, everything has to be a meeting. And so I've had a very frequent feedback that, you know, is there ways that we can protect people's time essentially? Um, where before something would be like a little bit of a, a quick conversation, you show up at someone's desk and you ask something. Now it turns into a Zoom call in a meeting and mm -hmm. meetings have a tendency to fill up the allocated time. You know, yep. if you're like standing over someone's desk, you ask someone and then after like two minutes, you're tired of standing there. So you like wrap it up and you go back. Right. Now it's like, well, we booked a half hour meeting. So let's just talk for half an hour. Yeah. Um, so it's been hard to protect people's time. Um, I, I wonder, it was... like, it's interesting because, like, I, I've also heard of some people, like, peop, a lot more people can sit in on meetings and work uh, and just kind of, you know, hit mute and then continue working and then be there if they need to be there for... <sighs> yes it, and no. I mean, this is a different topic, but I, I, I would... I would question if people are as productive when they do that <laughs> as they think they are. Um, you know, there's this, this growing mindset that multitasking is not really multitasking. Sure. Um, and I've heard a new phrase come out funny enough recently called single tasking, um, <laughs> which is like focusing on one thing and one thing alone. And that's actually, um, huh. what I used to do when I was a team lead at past companies is I had a rule where you cannot bring your laptop to a meeting unless it's required by the meeting. So if we were doing something where we were doing demos and you needed a laptop for a demo, then yeah, bring your laptop. But if we're doing, you know, an estimation meeting and I have my laptop to show on the projector, um, the tasks that we're walking through, no one else needs their laptop. They should be fully engaged in the meeting. And cause I found that, you know, we would have a discussion going on. Someone would be quiet the whole time. So it's like, there's, it could be that concept where they're listening and they're going to be like, oh, actually, but more often right. than not, I found that they're just not engaged. Yeah. And then when we ask a question, then there's that whole, oh, sorry. 
what was that? <laughs> and so like, I do find there's a lot of like, I have a lot of meetings where, you know, you'll see, especially some laptops, I don't know who designed this, the webcams right in front of the keyboard. So essentially you see like <laughs> really? their fingers going as and I'm like, I could see you typing and nothing we're doing right now requires typing. It's like so. you're fondling the, the everybody in yeah. the meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I do find that like some people I chat to, to be totally fair, um, have said like this works really well for them. You know, they they have their setup exactly as they need. There's no distractions. They actually prefer not to have those side conversations going on where they feel the need to like listen in in case mm. it affects them. So they do prefer working from home. So, you know, it depends on the person, of course. Um, there is some benefit to that. Um, for myself, you know, sometimes as a, as a manager, your role is working with other people. So working from home is not, at least for myself, I find not as aligned with that. Yeah. And so to kind of wrap things up a little bit here, um, I, 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 want, I wonder a lot about how permanent a lot of this stuff is, right? How, or at least the permanent effects that of, of this year will have on us. Where do you see us in like a year or yourself and your team or wherever you happen to work a year or two from now where do you see your like self in terms of how you approach work uh it, it, it do you see any uh what do you see sticking around what do you hope gets better um do you, what do you see going back to normal what do you see never never going back to normal um right you know a, a few things some people have talked about how you know well, you see in the news, like companies saying that, oh, we're going to work remote permanently, things like that. Yeah. Um, I, not to be, I don't want to say the word pessimistic. I, I doubt that we'll see a huge influx of companies going 100% remote, meaning like we're not going to maintain office space. We are going to have 100% remote workforce. I know there are some companies that do that with a lot of success. Um, I think we're I going think it to depends definitely... on the project almost a lot of times. It's just like, yeah, a little bit. I think we're going to see a lot more choice though. I've had a lot of companies, companies that I've worked for that maintained that it was impossible to work remote. You know, mm -hmm. we need to have you in the office. This is where people get better work done. And I think we're going to see a lot of companies now that are giving you the choice. We maintain an office, come in either when you feel like it or X number of days a week, or if you need to work from home, that's cool. Um, I really think we're going to, it's going, it, if it hasn't already yet, I'd be surprised if it hasn't. People, companies are going to realize that there's really no concrete barrier preventing you from allowing your employees to work remote. We can debate mm. the, the pros and cons, but you can give this person a laptop and send them home and they can work. Right. You know, so we're going to see a lot of companies giving that choice, I feel. Um, I also think that we're going to see more discussion on mental health. Because um, I'm finding that for myself and people that I deal with, we have to be very aware that people may be struggling with things. They may be suffering in ways, um, you know, some people thrive working from home. Other people are in the same house that they live in is now the house that they work in staring at the same walls, not having those social connections. Mm -hmm. We need to be aware that these people might be struggling with things. And so, you know, at D2L there's, we've tried to implement lots of different discussions and, and, ways that people can reach out, connect with others and mm. different mindfulness techniques. Um, but I think that this is going to be an ongoing discussion is that um, it's not going to be just you show up at work and you work and it's just everyone's going to be 100% okay with that. We're going to have to be aware of that people may be struggling in different ways that now are even less visible because we're not seeing them in the office. And we're really, at least I hope that we're going to be really cognizant of, of that. Um, whether it's uh, allowing people some flexibility in their time, you know, mm -hmm. um, I've had some conversations where it's like, hey, if you aren't able to like sit there and churn out eight hours, maybe break up your day into something that works for you. Maybe do four hours, take a four hour break. Is that four a hours. new conversation you've, 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 you've had, or do you think that's new in what way? New in like the idea of like breaking up your day, like at when you're going into the office, there's the expectation of like, while you're in the office between this hour and this hour, you're working. Um, it, it, it would be 
I don't, I don't it depend on the company, but it'd be kind of weird if somebody left the office for two hours in the middle on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've had to adjust my mindset because I was very much so in the mode of like, yeah, you have to be here for the first meeting in the morning and you're expected to be here, you know, until this point in the day. And if someone was at like two o'clock, like, hey, I'm going to peace for two hours, I'd be like, you can't really do this. And I've actually had that kind of conversation before. And so I've had to adjust my mindset where it's like, yeah, you know, if someone's working from home, and they're just not having it today, they're just, they're on an off day. Like, what am I accomplishing by saying, well, you have to be sitting there? Like, nothing. It, I'm just, if anything, prolonging a, a state that's not productive for that person mm -hmm. when they could, you know, go and peace out and, you know, do whatever, spend time with their family, go for a walk. You know, I see that all the time now. People drop in the chat, like, hey, I'm going for a walk. I'll be back in an hour. Right. And everyone's like, okay, cool. I'll talk to you in an hour. Like, because why not? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say it's it's a slippery slope in that um, you know I I worry sometimes where I don't want people to bleed their work into their home time too much you know because to say like I'm going for a walk and I'll put in the time later okay yeah cool but if someone's like oh man you know I I had a really rough day so I'm gonna work from like ten till two in the morning and they're encroaching mm -hmm. on their sleep like I feel like we can get to a point where we don't have a healthy balance between work and home um, mm. but I do hope that. Uh, we have companies that are more accommodating to the fact that like people might need to, to take a break. Like, I don't think as a species we're built to sit at a desk for eight hours and be productive from this scheduled time to that scheduled time. That's not how our brains operate. I really don't think so. I hope that we see companies that are willing to accommodate for when people are most productive. I hope to see that as well. I've been hoping um, that we'll see less of a stigma from people who want to work from home. Um, or work remotely if if even once we all start going back into the office less of a stigma of that a lot more focus on people yeah like you said uh, being able to take the time on their mental health being able to take the time on spending time with their family take um, going for a walk with their family or um, that kind of thing I'm, I'm hoping that that's something we get out of this and something that we come out of this uh, feeling a little bit better about yeah definitely yeah so thanks a lot, Kyle, for uh, for your time. Thanks for joining me today on my inaugural episode of the Coco Vintage Show. Uh, for sure, yeah. Thanks for having me.